This program is made possible in part by Salute America Incorporated, sharing heritage and saluting heroes, and by the Museum of Aviation Foundation in Warner Robins, Georgia, proud sponsor of programs that support American aviation history and education. As I pulled up, the zero that had been shooting at me made the mistake of rolling on the top of his climb. I dove at him and shot him down with a short burst. You've lived all your life praying for that moment. Since I was a little boy, I'd always wanted to do what these people did in World War I. And you get to do it. It's what you're made for. It's what you got to be. Then the word we had been waiting for so eagerly came. Take them. Tigers, take them. Down we went. And in a flash, we were closing in on them and choosing our targets. The formation was so perfect and so close, we couldn't miss. I would always go close because you can't miss that way. General Chenault would always criticize me a little for that. He said, there's no need of you going in this close, Scotty. Stand out there 600 yards and get the hit. I never did have the patience to do that. But now I saw traces all around me, and I felt a couple of hits. The zeros were shooting at me. It might be dangerous, right, but it's invigorating. It lifts you up, and the adrenaline is flowing. And then when you get back home, you see the field again, and you got something. You're proud of that. That's the greatest experience of your life. Best known for his book, God is My Co-Pilot, the World War II story of Robert L. Scott captured the attention of a nation in desperate need of a hero. At no time or place was that more true than in February of 1945 in Macon, Georgia, when Hollywood came south for the world premiere of the film, God is My Co-Pilot. When the film of Robert Scott was shown, I was 17 years old, so I remember it as a teenager. We love movie stars, but also we were impressed that we had such a hero that lived in our city. There was a large crowd at the parade. Store windows were decorated with things representing the book. Well, the Junior League sponsored the ball, and they had a grand march. They had the flags of all the Allied nations flying up on the stage. And with the movie, of course, it was sold out, and there were big crowds out in front. I love the movie but it was a lot of Hollywood. The stories of General Chenault and Bob Scott and the Flying Tigers just set me on fire. We didn't have anybody winning on the American side at that time. The Flying Tigers were the only folks that were winning, and it was a great morale booster. From flying and crashing a homemade glider for his Boy Scout Aviation Merit Badge to purchasing an airplane at the age of 13, Robert Scott seemed destined to fly. Determined to make aviation his career, he went back to high school after graduation to get the courses he needed for entry into West Point and a job with the Army Air Corps. Graduating in 1932, Second Lieutenant Scott was a time hog and grabbed flight time however he could. Training in Texas, flying airmail to New York, performing combat training runs in Panama, or working as a flight instructor. I always knew that I would meet somebody in the sky who loved his country as much as I love mine. He may be everything, but he wasn't going to have as much experience. I bet you the first Japanese I shot down had 200 hours, and I had 10,000. Despite all the time in the air, he also made time on the ground for the love of his life, Catherine Ricksgreen. Driving a 2,000 mile round trip on the weekends just for a few minutes to see her was normal and expected for Bob Scott. In 1941, now Major Scott with a young family at his side was working as a flight instructor in California when the Japanese struck Pearl Harbor. 
And I reported to my commander. He said, what are you doing up here, well, Bob? I had you down at this school. I said, well, son, that's what I want to talk to you about. And he put his arm over my shoulder and said, Bob, you were a fighter pilot, but it's passed you by now, son. You're 33 years old. Too old to fly in combat? For Scott, it was an unacceptable waste of nine years of training and justification to get into the war at any cost. And so, when asked by military intelligence planning a secret bombing mission over Japan, if he had ever flown a B-17, he said yes, knowing the consequences of a lie, but also knowing that this could be his only chance to see action. For hours that last night, I lay awake. Here was really all that mattered in my world, my wife and a little daughter. The real seriousness of our war gradually came upon me. Unless men like myself, thousands of them, millions, gave up these wonderful luxuries in our great land of America for a time, no matter if forever, we could lose it all. Sixth grade, 1974, McKibben Lane Elementary School. We'd go to the library and we'd look at the books. And I just happened to pick out this book called Great American Fighter Pilots of World War II. I'm flipping through the pages of the book and lo and behold, I come across a picture of a guy standing in front of a P-40 with a big glaring shark mouth on it and the guy's named Robert Scott and found out that he's from Macon, Georgia. So I was a little bit intrigued. So I went home that day and I found his name in the phone book. Well, I was too scared to call, so I ended up writing a letter. It was Robert L. Scott Sr., his dad. He calls me up on the phone and says, hey, uh, it's my son you want, Robert Lee Scott Jr. So me and my two best buddies, Gary and Dave, and we sent off letters to Robert L. Scott in Sun City, Arizona. And we'd take vigil by the mailbox, you know, and start checking the mail every day. I'm at my patrol boy post helping the kids get across the street one day, and Gary comes running down the street from his house. I mean, running like he'd been struck by lightning, waving a big brown envelope. And sure enough, it was a letter from General Scott. So I hauled butt to the house as quick as I could. And, uh, I got to the mailbox and I had the same thing. We got a nice letter from him. We got an autographed photo and a paperback copy of God is My Co-Pilot, the book he had written. We wrote a letter back to him, thanking him for the stuff. And he wrote a letter back again. In the normal scheme of human events, it should have been, we wrote a letter, he sent us something back and it should have stopped. But it didn't stop. By this time, the idea became, we need to have the Robert L. Scott fan club. And it was top secret. You couldn't be in the fan club unless you had uh, a letter from Scotty, <laughs> which we did. We were the only three guys that we knew of that had a letter from Scotty. We had not grown up with any kind of stories about the hometown fighter pilot or the hometown hero. We thought that we were discovering him for the first time. Nobody we had known had told us about him. Our remaining air forces have operated on the other side of the world, in India and China. Japan's unwarranted campaign of aggression began 13 years ago. A powerful Jap Air Force had undisputed control of the Chinese skies. But in 1941, some visitors arrived in China. These were the Flying Tigers. Under the command of a master tactician, as Colonel Robert Scott arrived to the war in the Far East in early 1942, his secret bombing mission was scrubbed due to Japanese capture of Allied territory. Success in the China-Burma-India theater was critical to the war effort, for China represented the best chance of establishing air bases for strategic bombing of Japan and its supply lines. The colonel was reassigned to fly overloaded cargo planes on a dangerous mission over the Himalayan mountains into China. While the mission, known as Fly in the Hump, brought critical war supplies to Allied forces fighting against Japan, it also brought Colonel Scott one step closer to his dream of being a combat fighter pilot. I kept trying to find Chanel, and I knew of the Flying Tiger. And finally, I landed at Loy Wing, Burma one day. Found that Chenault was there. I see the Jeep coming. With the Japanese attack imminent, Chenault ordered Scott to get his cargo plane off the airfield. Seizing the moment, Scott tried to reason with the general. 
His plane was too overloaded to move quickly. Pointing to the only fighter plane still on the field, the colonel asked if he could fly it instead. He said, you're in the wrong uniform and you're too high ranking. And I said, sir, I've always heard that you thought a man never did get too high ranking to be a fighter pilot. And I kept talking. And he said, all right, get that plane, but get it off the field fast. They'll be here in two minutes. To General Chenault's surprise, the old spare parts plane rumbled to a start. It was a bold move that ultimately led to the colonel receiving his very own P-40 fighter plane as a loaner from the general and a gaining favor with the combat experienced flying Tiger pilots. And at first they hated me because they hated regular officers. Me and me and a colonel, most of them have been lieutenants. Why do we want to follow you? I said, I want you to follow me. I want to follow you and learn the things you know just taught you. But then I began to fly guest missions with them. Later on, they became my friends and taught me all that you know taught them. Over in China, those guys basically took an airplane that was really outclassed by the uh, Zero. It really was a better airplane. I hate to say it, but the Japanese Zero greatly outpaced the P-40. And they really had to learn how to fly and fight and survive against the Zero. When you're up there flying over the clouds, what we hear and what we see is really what they would see in World War II. It's just an honor to be a part of that. Amazing to think this airplane was fairly obsolete you know, in 1941 or 42. You have to fly these airplanes all the time. I get shot down at all the air shows. I feel as though it's my patriotic duty. Somebody has to do it, that might as well be me. You read about these guys in history books, and it really just doesn't do it justice to come out and see these aircraft still flying and to really connect with those guys a little more and to learn what they did for our freedoms. It's amazing. With his very own fighter plane and combat lessons from the Flying Tigers, Colonel Scott had fully realized his boyhood dream to be a fighter pilot in combat. He took to the skies over Burma, escorting C-47 cargo planes, flying the hump, and wreaking havoc on Japanese forces wherever he could find them. It wasn't long until his first encounter with the infamous Zero. Escorting the C-47, I called this Japanese plane all by itself, I came out of the sun, and it wasn't anything to do with it aimed at one thing and not anything else. And I shot it down. Success in the skies over Burma and in the papers back home further caught the attention of General Chenault and leaders in the Chinese Army. Ultimately, they handpicked the colonel for the job he considered to be the greatest honor he would ever receive in the war. of China's famous American volunteer group of fighter pilots, the Flying Tigers, join the U.S. Army Air Forces. It means a change of uniform and a simple Air Force number to designate the group, but they're still the same old Tigers underneath. The group meets Colonel Scott, who takes over command for the U.S. Army. He greets Chinese officers who have served in this splendid outfit. Colonel Scott relieves Brigadier General Claire Chenault as commander of one of the most efficient and spectacular fighting groups in aviation history. New American pilots who join this group under Colonel Scott will inherit the fighting traditions of a tiny force which alone has held an air superiority over large sections of China. And I was at the house one day, and Gary came running to the house, red face and out of breath. It was a half mile from his house to mine. I opened the door, and he almost fell into me. He said, Scott's coming. <laughs> and so, you know, we're dancing around like a bunch of <laughs> idiots. But uh, General Scott's coming to visit. After school, we put on our cleanest pair of jeans tried to dress up a little bit, comb my hair, and uh, started watching for General Scott. And we see a car dart by real quick with the Arizona plates on it. And so we went running down the steps. He parked the car on the street and came running up the driveway. He ran, the 66-year-old man came running up the driveway and uh, stuck his hand out and said, which one's Gary? And then George and David, and, and he met us and we went inside and uh, sat in a den and, and he just told us stories and, and that's the first meeting. <laughs> <laughs>
Eventually, what would happen is every time he would come to town, if his schedule permitted, he would come see us. This all started from a letter. I don't know what caused that to happen, but uh, it's just an amazing thing. As we progressed through the ranks and getting to junior high school, of course, we took the fan club with us. The school newspaper found out, and so they did a story in the school newspaper. What happened after that is that the Macon Telegraph picked up on that story. We made the Sunday edition in color. As that turned out, our model building interest caught the eye of a group of folks in Warner Robins. The IPMS is a worldwide organization of modelers, primarily static models, and we have branches in about 45 or so countries. They invited us to start attending the model meetings that they have in Warner Robins. What happened is they said, well, we need to have a chapter here, but we'd like to have a name. And one of the men in the chapter said, well, these boys know General Scott. Why don't we try to name it after him? They wrote General Scott a letter, and he graciously consented to do it. So they were formed as the General Robert L. Scott chapter. On July 4, 1942, Robert L. Scott took command of the 23rd Fighter Group to continue the winning tradition of the Flying Tigers. The Colonel trained new recruits, planned combat missions, and led by example, downing a total of 13 Japanese airplanes with nine more listed as probables. He quickly became the leading ace fighter pilot in the war. In China, fighter pilots often investigated downed enemy aircraft for intelligence information. And on one occasion, the colonel came face to face with the realities of war. So to get the credit, I went out where the rank was. And the first thing you do is go through the pockets of an enemy pilot to find out where he's from. So you know where the outfit is. And you came to a little green book. And out of that green book, there fell a picture of, of two little girls. And you realize then that you've killed the man who's the father to these little girls. And I got a very sad reaction, having a little girl. It reminds you of something, a very sad thing in it. But that's the way war is. While Colonel Scott and his 23rd fighter group achieved continued success, the outlook of the larger war was grim. In the Pacific, the Allies were struggling to stop the advance of Japanese forces, and in Europe, Nazi powers were on the offensive. Meanwhile, in America, morale was at an all-time low. And so, as Colonel Scott's exploits as an ace fighter pilot became known, he became the focus of a military looking to promote good news from the war. Pulled from combat, he was ordered home. And General Arnold sent me out making speeches. And that's where I got the idea that if I could put them all down some way, I could give him the tapes and whatever they were and say, now can I go back to China? Determined to get back to the action, the Colonel worked nonstop for three days and nights in a New York hotel room, speaking his entire war story into a dictaphone recorder. The result became the book, God is My Co-Pilot. Little did Scott know that his story would capture the imagination of America, including some influential friends in Hollywood, who fast-tracked the book into a movie production with the grand premiere in Scott's hometown of Macon, Georgia. I've been 10 years of my life to have traded places with any of those men, but there I was for the first time on the outside. It seemed that everything I'd worked for since I was The museum itself opened in 1984. We had a small case showing some of the models, and we asked the museum director if we could put a couple of photographs of General Scott out and a little information to let him know about our namesake. At that time, we were looking for exhibits. He said, well, General Scott, he kept talking about General Scott. It had been more or less forgotten, it seemed. But then a lot of the World War II vets had. Found out he's a man that wrote, God is my co-pilot. He grew up in Macon. He had done these fabulous things during World War II that were legendary. The next thing we knew, we received a box. And it is his West Point uniform, his general's uniform. He was 78. He was full of enthusiasm for anything relating to his Air Force life. We opened the first God is My Co-Pilot exhibit in May of 1986. 
for which General Scott agreed to come and cut the ribbon. With the book and film complete, Colonel Scott was finally back in China doing what he did best when the atomic bombs were dropped and Japan surrendered. Recognizing the significance of the event, the colonel wrote a commemorative letter to his old Boy Scout leader and troop and flew it with him in his fighter plane over the surrender ceremony. Tokyo, Japan, 1945. Mr. A.E. Moore and Troop 23. Dear Scouts, in an hour or so, I'll fly this letter over Tokyo and then out over Tokyo Bay to circle the battleship Missouri. I guess I've seen an interesting time in this war, but good Americans are buried on lots of strange islands and places. I saw 9,000 white crosses yesterday marking graves on Okinawa. We're the lucky ones. They paid for this entry into an enemy land. When I read that letter, it talks to me that I need to stand up for our country. I need to be that American that this country needs. And that is something that I took to my kids and said, this is a person you want to look to as a role model. And because of that, he being a distinguished Eagle Scout, we wanted to honor him and change the name of the district to the Robert L. Scott District. Liberty is paid for in the good blood of men. Always remember that. It will never be any other way. I know of no better way of living than as a Boy Scout, in such a manner that no matter what comes, you are prepared to serve your country in peace or in war. Thank God that I am an American. Sincerely, Bob Scott. After World War II, Colonel Scott continued a distinguished military career. He commanded a fighter in bomber wing, graduated from the National War College, and was promoted to general while assigned as the Director of Information for the U.S. Air Force. He retired from the service to Phoenix, Arizona until the passing of his wife in the early 1970s. Then, like so many other military veterans, he was underappreciated. Until letters and invitations arrived from new admirers in Macon, Georgia. At this time, the World War II generation, and him included, they're not being celebrated. They weren't known as the greatest generation then. They were just a bunch of old guys. So here he comes back home to middle Georgia to bring them some artifacts, fell in love with the whole idea the idea of coming back to Warner Robins to work with the Museum of Aviation and to help it grow, it gave him a purpose. Well, guess what? He's in the papers again. He's on the television for the museum. Uh, he's making speeches. And he used to say it like this, if you really want to do it, you'll find a way. And then we'd follow on with some education programs and say, well, you better learn your math and science and study in school. <laughs> Their drawing card the Babe Ruth of fighter pilots was Scotty. It really put him back on the map again in this area. He was always full speed ahead. So we went to places great and small. There wasn't any place that he went that he couldn't draw a crowd. He knew how to get on, say what he had to say, and get off. And that was his charm. He just wanted you to know how lucky you were to be here and how you ought to thank God every day and do the right thing. And he'd get down to ground level with the little kids. They'd say, are you General Scott? Laugh, he'd say, yes, I am. He could talk to me or you. He could talk to the chief of staff of the Air Force, and he could talk to airplane mechanics, senators. When he came, it was like a fuel injection. You know, more passion than anybody could imagine, more energy, more enthusiasm. What General Scott helped instill in the museum was that you build the character and the quality and the courage day by day. Then, when you have a chance to serve the nation, whatever it is, whether it's in the military, or whether it's a scientific development, or whether it's teaching a young kid in school, all of those things require dedication and energy and character. Never met anybody that affected me like John Scott. 
a war hero doesn't do him justice. He was just a hero to this area in the sense that he symbolized something that was good. Not only what he did, but how he went about doing it, not letting anything stop him. It's the greatest feeling in the world to look up and see the instrument and realize you're flying. You're doing the thing you prayed to do all your life. It just shows you again that you can have anything you want in this life if you want it badly enough and work for it. And General Scott epitomized the expression that freedom is not free. It requires sacrifice. This guy that was famous, he was a fighter pilot from World War II and was an ace. He would take time, as busy as he was, to write you a letter. That made us feel like we were something. And that's something that, as a scout, as an individual, and just as an American, that you can look to and say, I want to be like General Scott. If it wasn't for them, America would not be what it is today. I might not even be able to go to Boy Scouts in the morning, or I might not be able to go to school. So. Thank you for protecting America and everything you love. But as we used to talk things over in China, we all used to agree that we were fighting for the American girl. She to us was America, democracy, Coca-Colas, hamburgers, clean place to sleep, or the American way of life. And though the world we face today is fundamentally different, those human traits of character have not changed. We still need people that have that character that General Scott had. This program has been made possible in part by Salute America Incorporated, sharing heritage and saluting heroes, and by the Museum of Aviation Foundation in Warner Robins, Georgia, proud sponsor of programs that support American aviation history and education.